Uh, we apologize for being a little late, but as you might expect, uh, we had a big turnout at the corporation meeting, and at the conclusion of it, uh, everyone wanted to come up and say hello and congratulate our new president-elect. So it took us a little more time to get down here than, than we expected, so we, we appreciate your patience. I'm Dana Mead, the uh, chairman of the MIT Corporation. Uh, seated here to my right and to your left are first uh, Jerry Friedman, Institute Professor, Nobel Laureate, who chaired the Faculty Advisory Committee uh, in the search for the new president. Uh, the Faculty Advisory Committee was composed of 18 distinguished faculty, cutting across uh, nearly every discipline in the Institute as well as uh, a, a large representation of each rank uh, and uh, age group in, in the uh, institute. Highly distinguished group. Sitting next to him is Raphael Bras, um, who is the chair of the MIT faculty, who was instrumental in working with Jerry and putting the faculty advisory committee together uh, and in the work that they did. Seated next to Raphael is Jim Champy, who chaired uh, the Corporation Committee on the Presidency, which is uh, just a very long and fancy name uh, for the search committee of the corporation. Uh, and I should say that one of the major features of this search was the fact that our faculty advisory committee and our uh, corporation committee worked jointly uh, joined at the hip throughout, interviewed jointly, and the like. And when you get into questions, we're certainly willing to, to cover that. Um, this morning, the corporation met, and on recommendation of the executive committee of the corporation, uh, unanimously elected Professor Susan Hockfield, who's currently the provost of Yale University, as MIT's 16th president. Uh, Susan is here. She's going to say a few words. But before I invite her to the podium, let me introduce her husband, Tom Byrne, and her daughter, Elizabeth, who have joined us today. And with that, and no further remarks by me, Susan, would you like to come up and say a few words, please? Hello, friends. <laughs> um, I'm incredibly excited to be here. I'm deeply honored to have been selected as MIT's 16th president. As a scientist, I've always regarded MIT as a beacon, projecting an incredibly bright light that has illuminated the path of discovery and innovation for the entire world. And I know that I'm only one of countless people who have been inspired and at times certainly awed by MIT's strengths along the entire continuum of scholarship, from the most fundamental basic research into the nature of our world to the most advanced applications and technologies. It is, of course, the mission of every university to produce and disseminate knowledge. And yet, MIT advances both parts of this mission at an astonishing rate. Discoveries and innovations have poured forth from the Institute in a staggering torrent, from engineering and science to be sure, but just as impressively from economics, business, the arts, the social sciences, and the humanities. Now, as you might imagine, over the last several weeks, I have become increasingly attuned to any mention of MIT. And perhaps not surprisingly, hardly a day has gone by without news of some MIT discovery some invention, some new program coming to my attention. MIT's remarkable history of discovery and invention alone might well have been enough to draw me here. But over these last few months, I've discovered another critically important feature of this institution's character. And it's something that speaks to the values and ideals that seem to be the very foundation of this place. From my very first conversations in the search process, I kept hearing about three of MIT's central values. Truth, the pursuit of truth, integrity, and the great meritocracy. 
I heard this from trustees, I heard it from faculty, I heard it from students, and I heard it from staff members. And what I heard told me that this was a place whose values closely mirrored my own, a place whose mission I could truly embrace, and a place where Tom, Elizabeth, and I could really feel at home. I would guess that many of you are wondering how I imagine the future for MIT. And I have to reassure everyone that I am not planning to bring a kennel of Yale Bulldogs or a truck full of Yale paraphernalia to this campus. What I believe in is building strength on strength. Each of MIT's schools and activities must continue to be strong and distinctive. And we must continue to look for opportunities to amplify these strengths through collaboration, through shared vision, and through shared work. My overarching goal is to help MIT to be an even greater MIT, to become even better at education, at research, and at invention. Part of this goal will be met by ensuring that anyone who has the extraordinary talents and ambition to make the most of what MIT has to offer has a fair chance to join this community. Also, I'll do everything I can to maintain MIT's leadership in setting the agenda for national policy in research and education, as well as to build bridges with academic centers and other nations. What do I want to see in M MIT's future? Put quite simply, I want MIT to be the dream of every child who wants to make the world a better place and also the dream of every engineer, scientist, scholar, and artist who draws inspiration from the idea of working in a hotbed of innovation in service to humanity. I want to thank the search committee and its advisory groups of faculty and students for the gracious and intelligent yet probing conversations that we've had over the course of the search process. I am truly looking forward to continuing those conversations and to starting new conversations with other people in the community. And in particular, I thank Jim Champy, Jerry Friedman, Dana Mead, for their steady help and the very many insights that they have shared about what Paul Gray calls this special place. I would be remiss, indeed, if I did not seize this opportunity, although I am certain there will be many, many more, to salute Chuck Vest for his absolutely extraordinary leadership both here at MIT and on the national scene. He's brought forward a great number of key initiatives and has forged important new directions over the 14 years he has served as MIT's president. For his work, both for MIT and for the nation, I extend my personal thanks. At this point, I've only just started to learn about MIT. This is now the season of going back to school, and it's time for me to do the same. I am looking forward to learning from the students, faculty, staff, and alumni, non, alumni who will be my teachers in the weeks and months ahead. I am simply incredibly excited to be joining this learning community, and I'm honored beyond words to join this institution as MIT's next president. Thank you. I think MIT is an incredibly great place, and I want to help make it even greater. Um, at this point, I can't tell you where my, in, my uh, attention will focus in the immediate weeks and months, um, but I um, have to say that uh, in the positions I've held at Yale, I have learned that there is extraordinary insight uh, that comes out of the community, and I will be talking to the people in this community to learn from them where they see the greatest opportunities to be for MIT. Search committee, if uh, one of them could perhaps talk about um, what they see as the 
particular challenges at MIT at the moment and why uh, this choice was, re reflects uh, the confidence in her ability to meet those particular yeah. challenges. But could you ask, please, the questioners to identify what their publication is? Because I don't know you well enough. Sure, I just want I, to I, I connect them with a face, if I could. That is uh, Justin Polk in the Associated Press. Uh, press okay. And um, Jerry, or whoever would like to answer, please. Thank you. you put from the bottom. Thank you, and let me take this first opportunity to thank Susan for really assuming this great opportunity and, uh, uh, and role to be our, to be our new leader. Uh, Justin, the, you know, there, uh, MIT, I think MIT's greatest challenge is how we, to, how we really continue our, our, you know, our role of service and, and to some degree greatness in what we've been able to, you know, achieve in, in the past. We stand at this point on an extraordinarily, I think, good footing particularly from the perspective of, of our faculty, of our, of our students, of the quality of the people and the resources that we, uh, you know, that we have here. Uh, and the real question, I think, for the future is how to take those, those capabilities and really extend them and, and build on them, as, as Susan has, has said. Uh, this is, a, I think, a particularly unique time, and the, I think the search committee felt uh, strongly both in MIT's development, again, because uh, we believe we have great strengths, but it's also a unique time in the development of science and, and, where, and where we are and how we might leverage everything that we're learning and on the verge of learning of science. That's the, that's the great opportunity that I think we see. And also how we take that learning not only in the field of science, but and move it into, into our other and, and along with our other disciplines. I might add just one thing. Jim you may have heard it, but uh, the whole issue of collaboration uh, among the sciences and the engineering. MIT is poised uh, with the terrific um, science and engineering that it has to really take advantage of, of the combination of the two, bringing engineering disciplines and skills and analysis to the life sciences and bringing the insights of the life sciences back to engineering. And we feel that we are ideally poised. And one of the reasons we're so pleased to have a scientist who understands this combination and relationship uh, in the future because it is one of the big challenges, not just of MIT, but of, of science and engineering progress uh, throughout the world and in particularly in the United States. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. I'm from the graduate student news at MIT. Um, and as Dean of Graduate Students at Yale, I think we've had a lot of experience working with graduate students. So do you have any plans for graduate school here? And how do you see your um, back home at the flying Yeah, that's a great question. Is, uh, uh, I was Dean of the Graduate School at Yale for um, almost five years. And MIT has a phenomenal graduate school with absolutely terrific graduate students. And um, what might I bring uh, from my experience at Yale uh, to these graduate students here? Um, Yale had several challenges when I took over the deanship there, and um, you know some of it is, are the things that are just always present in an academic environment, which is building further strength in the disciplines you have. And um, you know, of course, as um, president of MIT, this will be the preeminent you know, um, goal is to make sure that all of the graduate programs are as strong as they might be and have opportunities to grow even stronger. Um, one of the things that um, I worked on quite a bit. At, at Yale is building a real community for graduate students and integrating the graduate school and the graduate students more into the entire university community. Um, I'm a big believer in learning communities and I will be looking for opportunities to really develop those learning communities even you know, more strongly than they currently exist at MIT. There's tremendous power in the people and you know, these are, you know, this is a place that has extraordinary students, extraordinary faculty and helping to build bridges so that they can talk to one another and collaborate more, um, I think is always a good thing. I'm from the tech. Um, how do you foresee your relationship with the undergraduate population? Do you foresee like a daily interaction? Or how are you planning to? Yeah, so how am I going to interact with undergraduates? Um, well, I'm going to start out. <laughs> Uh, I've got a lot of learning ahead of me, and in the weeks and months ahead, I'm going to meet with as many people as I can. While I was dean of the graduate school, I spent um, you know, a lot of time just going around meeting with people, and I find um, both formal interactions in groups, but informal interactions just walking around campus. 
uh, to be a good way to get a feeling for a place, and I will do the same here. Now, of course, I know very little about how life at MIT is actually conducted and how work at MIT actually gets done, um, and so I will, of course, be responsive to the cadence of life and work here as I figure out ways to really be in touch with um, the students, the faculty, the staff. Mm -hmm. uh, th this, uh, this may be a good occasion just to reinforce something, um, and uh, I think the tech is well aware of it, but uh, early in this process I sent a letter to the student leaders, both graduate and undergraduate, and asked them if they would assist us in this search, first by providing us with a, a student's view, both from the undergraduate and the graduate level, of what they felt were the major challenges for MIT that the next president would have to address. And also how they uh, viewed uh, the relationship of the leadership and administration of the institute uh, in, with them and in their lives. They gave us a, a terrific piece of paper. And as you know, they had meetings and, and talked to many people. Uh, it was such a good analysis, we felt, that we asked the student leadership to come in and appear before the faculty advisory committee and the search committee in person to discuss their views and what they believed. Um, it, was, it was a critical part of this process and a very, very important process. And as soon as they were aware that we had made a choice, um, they contacted me since I was the one that sent them the first letter and volunteered to participate in the transition. And Susan will have an opportunity to work with them uh, and what, what their view of a successful transition, in other words, relationships with the student leadership, student clubs, the living areas, and so forth, as, as she begins to get acquainted uh, with the pulse and the, and the heartbeat of MIT from the student level. So we think uh, this is terrific because the students are basically just picking up where they left off in the search process and then are going to create, I think, a very open and good relationship uh, with the new president. Thank you. Yeah. I would only add, I, I had a chance to meet with some members of this uh, student advisory group and um, they are you know, simply an inspiring group. It was both uh, undergraduate and graduate students and. Um, you know, no one, uh, you know, no group articulated, you know, the mission and the passion for MIT as uh, acutely as the students did. So I'm very impressed and I'm really looking forward to um, further conversations with the students on this campus, both graduate and undergraduate students. Marcella, did you have a follow-up and take your hand up? Oh, uh, well, actually, just let me, simple question. When are you going to start? <laughs> um, early December. Is, is my expected start date. You know, of course, you know, a lot of it can happen between now and then, but that's uh, what we're anticipating uh, by the end of the fall. Uh, yeah, another question for Mr. Mead. Um, what, if anything, do you uh, think it says about MIT that the new president is one, a woman, and two, a life scientist? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, first, uh, we think it's terrific that we have a woman and a life scientist. Um, I think uh, I read the Boston Globe, if you forgive me, those of you that don't work for the Globe this morning, and uh, Marcella made, I think, that point. I should say, however, that uh, the selection was, as much as possible, gender blind, and it was intended that way, and was conducted that way. Um, and uh, we selected the best person for this job for MIT going forward. Incidentally, happens to be a very distinguished scientist and a woman, uh, but uh, that was not a, that was not, the gender was not the prime determination or even a determination in this process. I think Jim would reinforce that and so would Jerry. So we're pleased, um, but uh, we didn't set out and we did not conduct it in a way to get us to that point. We went, as they say in uh, sports, for the best athlete. 
And that's what we got. Katie, the the New York Times. Can you touch on the life sciences part on that, too? Does that represent a, a shift in MIT as well? Uh, I guess I'm still up, huh? <laughs> Um, ever heard the question, does life scientists represent a shift? Uh, there is already a shift underway, as you know. Um, this is the first year, I believe, in the history of MIT that uh, the research dollars uh, from NIH, which is basically paren life sciences, equals or exceeds research dollars from Department of Defense. So the shift is already taking place, and it's very positive. I mean, we're pursuing basically the frontiers of science at the same time that our engineering departments are pursuing the frontiers in the areas in which they, they work. Um, one of Susan's challenges, and one which impressed us as she talked about it, was, as I intimated earlier, to bring those two strengths together and to make two and two equal five, which we think can happen here and should happen. It will not only benefit MIT, it'll benefit the nation, and it'll benefit humanity and the world because there's huge leverage in these two areas, science and engineering, and MIT is ideally positioned to take advantage of it. Uh, as far as the life sciences, all you have to do is look around the campus you can see brain and cognitive sciences uh, going up over there. We've announced the Broad Institute. There are many other signals and symbols uh, of, of this shift, but I, I wouldn't overestimate the dramatic nature of the shift. It isn't. It's evolutionary. It's founded on very strong science and the ability to have a very, very strong faculty in each of these areas, which we have. Thank you. If there, is, uh, if there are no more questions, we've just about run out of time. If there's one more, we might be able to take it. But if not, um, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dennis.